Welcome to another episode of Frame Minds Engineering. Previously, we have discussed Euler Bernoulli beams, which have a single degree of freedom perpendicular to the member, and columns have a single degree of freedom in the direction of the member. What happens if we have both? In most finite element analysis software, there is no distinction between beams and columns. So how come that those members can capture the effects of bending, shear, and axial loading? This is where beam columns come to light, and this is the basic formulation used in most finite element analysis software. In order to understand what is happening inside a beam column with a distributed load that varies along the length of the beam, we will investigate the equilibrium of forces. So let us look at an internal segment of a beam column of length dx. The bold line represents the absolute horizontal from which the displacements will be measured. The dashed line is the initial state of the beam column in case it has any initial deformation. The dashed and dotted line represents the deformed state of the beam column considering a second order analysis in which the deformed state is used to form the equilibrium equations but the deformations are small. W0 is the initial deformation, T is the transverse force, L is the longitudinal force, and M is the bending moment. Let's have a look at the equilibrium in the vertical direction. The change in transverse force along x multiplied by dx gives us the resultant of the right and left hand side transverse forces which is balanced out by the distributed load along the length dx. And in the horizontal direction, the longitudinal force is a constant and does not change, so it balances itself out. When it comes to the bending moment, it's a bit more complex. The change of the bending moment along dx, which is counterclockwise, and the pair of longitudinal forces, which is also counterclockwise, is balanced out by the moment formed by the pair of transverse forces which is clockwise. The distance between the pair of transverse forces is obviously dx, while the distance between the longitudinal forces is the change of the vertical deflection along x multiplied by dx. Let's simplify the notation by referring to any variable that can be differentiated with respect to x as a prime variable. So our moment and vertical forces equilibrium equations will look like this. By differentiating the moment equilibrium equation and substituting the change in transverse forces term, we receive the following. We previously know from beam theory that the bending moment is equal to the curvature of the member multiplied by the bending stiffness EI. Because our positive sign convention is counterclockwise, the rotation phi is negative the change of deflection along x. And for the same reason, we need the minus sign for the bending moment as well. This allows us to substitute the moment term into the differential equation to develop a governing differential equation of a beam column. From the equilibrium of forces in the vertical direction, we can rewrite the equations in terms of the transverse force T. We can notice some characteristics of the governing differential equation, starting with analyzing the peak values of the bending moment along the beam column by taking the derivative of the bending moment with respect to x and equating it to zero. And as a reminder from beam theory, the shear forces in a beam can be found as follows. We can immediately see that the shear forces in a beam column are influenced by the longitudinal forces as well. We can also see that just like a beam, in a beam column the extremes of the bending moment coincide with the zeros of the shear, because they have the same term. Another remark is that all the terms of the governing equation have the same units of force over length. This gives us an insight on the structural behavior and resistance. We can see that the first term shows us the structural stiffness which resists the destabilizing forces due to second order theory as well as the external distributed loads. We can visualize the destabilizing forces by looking at the deformed geometry. We can then resolve the vertical components of the normal forces. The difference between them over the length dx gives us the destabilizing forces due to second order theory. So how can we resolve the transversal and longitudinal forces into normal and shear forces? For that, 
let us have a look at the geometrically nonlinear deformation of the beam column. We can resolve the forces in the direction of the shear as follows. This will give us the following expression for the shear. We can then resolve the forces in the direction of the normal force. And this provides us with the expression for the normal force. Now applying second order theory, we can apply the following trigonometric assumptions. And so we end up with the following expressions for shear and normal forces. And similarly, we can obtain the longitudinal and transversal forces from the shear and normal forces. Now let's ignore initial deformations and look at the solution for the governing differential equation. We can see that this is a fourth order linear non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation. Because the sign of L can change, there are two solutions for this equation. To make the solution look nice, we will call this term eta. When L acts in compression, we receive this solution. And when L acts in tension, we receive this solution. Let's have a look at both solutions graphically. Initially, when having a very low normal force, the difference between the tension and compression solutions is very minimal. But as the normal force starts to increase, we see how they start to diverge from each other. In blue is the compression curve, and in green is the tensile curve. For the green curve, we can see that as the normal forces increases, the deformation decreases. And for the blue curve, we can see that as the normal forces increase, the deformation increases as well. Because compression lessens the stiffness of the beam, while tension increases the stiffness of the beam. Let's see how manipulating the distributed load affects the deformed geometry of both curves. As expected, when having a lower distributed force, there is a lower deflection, and when having a higher distributed force, there is a higher deflection. What happens if the compressive normal force approaches Euler buckling, and what happens if the tensile force approaches the Euler buckling force? We see that as the force approaches the Euler buckling critical load, the beam column buckles in compression while in tension, nothing really happens. This is because the beam column cannot buckle under tension. When the compressive force exceeds the Euler buckling load, we enter the post-buckling phase. And if we continue to increase the compressive force, we see that at one point, the beam column would buckle again. This is the second buckling mode of the beam, or what we call in linear buckling analysis, as the second eigen mode of buckling. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.